Let's talk about race. Now, I can't see your faces, but I'm sure some of you just thought to yourself, oh, here we go, another conversation about race. In fact, some of you became incredibly uncomfortable as soon as I said the word race. But feeling uncomfortable talking about race pales in comparison to actually experiencing racial discrimination. Every day, millions of black and brown people leave their homes under the very real threat of racism and violence. Parents of black and brown children have conversations with them to prepare them for the inevitable racism they will encounter. I recall having such conversations in my own family with people telling me uh, how to interact around white people so that they don't feel threatened by me or how to engage with police officers so that they don't perceive me as a threat. Such conversations proved necessary because when I was about 18 years old, I'm driving a group of friends home from dinner when I'm pulled over by a police officer. When I come to a complete stop, the officer springs from his vehicle, runs over to my car, pounds on my window so hard I thought the glass was gonna break, points his gun in my face and shouts, let me see your effing hands. He then rips open my car door, reaches inside as if he's going to pull me out until he realizes I'm still strapped into my seatbelt, and he continues pointing his gun at me and shouting and cursing at me. I try to reason with this officer, but he gets even more agitated, and he calls for backup, and within minutes, I'm completely surrounded by cop cars and police officers. I'm ordered out of my vehicle and placed on the hood of a police cruiser. After being interrogated for what seems like an eternity, they finally tell me what all this is about. Allegedly, I had been speeding. Luckily, I was able to walk away that night unharmed, at least not physically harmed. And I like to think that's because I had a community of people looking out for my protection. But unfortunately, this community, the black community, did not offer the same level of protection when I came out as a member of the LGBTQ community a few years later. In fact, this same community was instrumental in perpetuating homophobic violence. And what was perhaps more distressing is that a lot of the homophobic rhetoric I heard in the black community sounded a lot like the racist rhetoric I heard from white people. And over time, I realized that the arguments that any one group would use to discriminate against another group was virtually the same. Let's look at a couple of examples. For instance, some root their discrimination against others in religious beliefs. White folks have used religion to justify racism, claiming that slavery was their God-given right and that Jim Crow segregation was necessary because God intended for the races to be separate. Folks have used religion to advance homophobic views, claiming that non-heterosexual relationships are immoral. Folks have used religion to advance sexist views, claiming that God placed men in charge and for women to be submissive. Folks have used religion to advance transphobic views, claiming that God created only two genders and that trans and non-binary identities are simply invalid. Folks have used religion to advance classist rhetoric, claiming that Wealth is a sign of God's prosperity and poverty is a sign of God's judgment. Folks have used the Bible to advance ableist views, depicting those with disabilities as being unclean, demon-possessed, or somehow in need of being changed. The arguments are all the same. In addition to religion, some folks root their discrimination of others in beliefs about nature or biology claiming that some people, such as white people and cisgender men, are just naturally superior, whereas others like the LGBTQ community and individuals with disabilities are unnatural or abnormal. The arguments are the same. And all of these arguments, all of these various kinds of discrimination are all rooted in white supremacy. White supremacy is an ideology that places people in a hierarchy. And at the top of this hierarchy is whiteness. Now, it's important to note that whiteness is not just about skin color, but rather whiteness represents an ideal type of person that is considered the most worthy and valuable in our society. And this takes into account their race, but also gender, sexual orientation, ability, and class status. And so in our society, the most valued person is white, cisgender, heterosexual, male, able-bodied, and wealthy. And any individual who does not fit this ideal type falls somewhere else in this hierarchy. 
Now, the interesting thing about white supremacy is that we are all socialized to believe that whiteness is something we should strive toward, even though only a handful of people will actually truly obtain this ideal. And so individuals who are on the lower levels of this hierarchy will fight tooth and nail, literally killing themselves, trying to get as close to whiteness as possible, even if that means stepping on other people and other groups in the process. And in this way, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and classism are all white supremacist ideologies. Now, we don't often think about white supremacy in this way, and this is part of its brilliant design. When we hear the word race, we almost automatically think about people of color and not white people. Similar to when we hear the word sexuality, we almost immediately think about non-heterosexual people and not straight people. And this is because whiteness has become so normalized in our society that we don't think about it. We don't even see it. And anything that is not whiteness becomes other and sticks out like a sore thumb. And this allows whiteness to continue to grow and operate in the shadows. Even those of us who are social justice minded fall into this trap because we're often so focused on people who are oppressed, the people being stepped on, that we don't take a critical look at the ones doing the stepping. And in a sense, we're only focusing on symptoms, but not the disease itself. And this allows white supremacy to perpetuate itself. So what's the solution? How can we try to fix this? For starters, we have to see whiteness and acknowledge the pervasiveness of white supremacy in our society. And this means that colorblindness is not an option. You know, I often hear people say things like, oh, I don't see race, I don't see color, I just see people as people. And while this may sound virtuous on the surface, it is incredibly harmful because if we don't see diversity and difference among people, then we can't possibly see the discrimination that people face on a daily basis. And if we don't see this discrimination, we can't devise solutions to end their oppression. And once we see whiteness, we have to attack the issue of white supremacy from all angles. This means that we can't just try to chop off individual branches of discrimination. We need to uproot the whole tree. When I think back to my unfortunate encounter with police nearly a decade ago, I'm sad to say that not much has changed. Sure, we've made some movement in our efforts for social justice, but the issues of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and classism are still incredibly pervasive in our society today. And I argue that this is because while we have been working hard, we have not been working together. And our failure to acknowledge all of these various isms as stemming from the same root has made our efforts for equity and justice less effective. This work is going to take all of us because although this system of white supremacy appears to benefit a handful of people, it is actually detrimental to the whole of our society and it is silently killing each and every one of us. So let's get to work and let's work together. Let's talk about race and white supremacy because doing so could save your life. Thank you.